For those of you remaining in the room, our scripture this morning comes from the Gospel of John, chapter 13. If you have your Bible, please turn there with me. We're going to start in verse 1 of John, chapter 13. This is the word of the Lord. It was just before the Passover festival, and Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The evening meal was in progress, and the devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power. And that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal. Took off his outer clothing and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet. Drying them with the towel that was wrapped around them. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, Oh, you do not realize now what I'm doing, but later you will understand. No, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered, Unless I wash you, You have no part with me. Then, Lord, Simon Peter replied, not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. Jesus answered, those who've had a bath need only to wash their feet. Their whole body is clean and you are clean. Though not every one of you. For Jesus knew who was going to betray him. And that was why he said not everyone was clean. When he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I've done for you? He asked them. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, You also should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Very truly, I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks Thanks be to God. God. Let's pray together. Lord, what an extraordinary gift it is uh, to have your word, your revelation of yourself to the world available to us. Lord, I am humbled by the task of proclamation that you've placed before me, and I ask that whatever is of me would be set aside so that we might give full attention, that we might give uh, full engagement to who you are and what you are offering to us this day. Lord, open our eyes that we would see, our ears that we would hear, Open our minds that we come to know and understand your word. Open our hearts that we would feel its power. In response, I ask that you would open our hands, that we would offer the world service, grace, and love on your behalf. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So I I know that we are in a season shifting from... uh, rapidly or slowly or at some pace from 
COVID. And there, there are some things that I wonder if they will ever be the same. One of those things I have questions about is housekeeping at hotels. Have you been to a hotel in the last six months? Uh, some hotels say, we have no housekeeping, clean your own mess. Other hotels say, we will be around every three days if you stay that long. And I believe that's probably because they calculated that the vast majority of their guests don't stay three days or more. Uh, and, so, and so you have this really odd situation where, uh, where uh, we had grown used to housekeeping on a daily basis uh, and snuggling into our freshly tucked, how do they tuck? I wish I knew how they tucked those beds in. Um, I believe that, that, by the way, that should be an adulting class that we're taught in high school, how to tuck in a, ho- a bed as a hotel housekeeper does. But anyway, uh, so... I know that what I'm about to invite you to to imagine requires us to go back in our mind's eye pre-COVID, but that's where I need you to be. Because if you're in like post-COVID, we don't know if we're ever going to have housekeeping again, then this might not make as much sense. So I need you to imagine with me that you're on a business trip, and you're there with three or four of your colleagues and your boss. And so on this business trip, uh, you're, you're all staying in the hotel, maybe uh, by chance or maybe by design. You're all on the same floor, and you wake up at 6.30 in the morning uh, to go downstairs for the breakfast buffet. This is a great hotel. It has the omelet bar, not, not, the, not, the, not the, the, the messy, like, you know, flimsy sausage-like breakfast, but like the good breakfast, right? Maybe, Maybe, maybe you know that they're making your pancakes fresh in front of you. Like this is the breakfast, 6.30 in the morning. You wake up, you go down. And as you're walking down your hall, you see a housekeeping cart. And you're like, wow, that's early. Someone must have checked out pretty early this morning. And as you walk by, you see the door open. Because for some reason, the door's always open when the housekeeping is there, right? Like it's propped open. And you look inside, and inside the door, you don't see one of the housekeepers from the hotel. You see your boss. And, and you see your boss uh, wiping down the mirror, uh, you know, washing out the sink, uh, tucking in that hotel bed that you don't know how to tuck in because you've never been trained in high school as you should have been. Uh, but they're tucking in the bed and making sure the pillows are all fluffy. And then, and then you see your, uh, your boss with the vacuum and you're like, wow, what in the world is happening? And so you say, boss. What's going on? Is this your room? Did you just need it special tidy? Do you have like a magnificent form of OCD that requires you to clean your own room at this level every morning? No, 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 no. This is your colleague's room. This is this is this is your colleague's room. They woke up, they already went down to breakfast, and I'm cleaning up after them. I'm cleaning their mess, all of the grit and grime. I'm just I'm taking care of them. Hey, what, what's your room number? I need to know your room number because I'm going to your room next. And you're like, oh, no, you ain't going to my room because in my room, I, I just trim my nose hairs. That's foul. Like I, you know, and they're probably still on the counter in the sink. Uh, like like I, I, I don't remember uh, what, what my bed looks like. My clothes are spread all over the place. I'm not a really organized hotel roomer. Like I, I'm, I'm disgusting. You're not going to my room. You're not cleaning my room. Oh, yeah, I'm absolutely cleaning your room, and I I cleaned your colleague's room. I'm going to clean the other people's rooms. Before I go do anything else, I'm making sure all of all of your businesses, it's all cleaned up, and everything is put back together and in order. How absurd is that idea? It absolutely makes no sense. I tell that story, and it's 100% never going to happen. You would never, ever in a million years have a boss that took on a servant's role in a situation that was not theirs to take on. And that pales in comparison to what we just heard from God's word in the gospel of John chapter 13. That idea of 
your boss cleaning your hotel room is crazy. It is not nearly as crazy as what we heard from John with regard to Jesus and his washing the disciples' feet. So we're going to walk through this passage. We're going to uh, attempt, hopefully, to be confronted with how radical this is. And in the end, it will still fall short, our understanding, and we're going to continue a lifetime's journey of leaning in to grasp what this means for us as followers of Jesus. And so we're going to walk through this passage. There's four different sections. There's a setup there's an action, there's an interaction, and then there's a teaching. Setup, action, interaction, and teaching. And so we're going to walk through it together and, and hear what, uh, what is there before us. So the first thing in the setup is verses 1 through 3. If you have your Bibles, you could follow along. We're going to see how it's set up. And, and one of the fascinating things for us is that the Gospel of John doesn't want us to get to the action before we understand some things that were absolutely known by Jesus and by others in this passage. We have to know what is known to enter in more fully and embrace what's there. So the first comes comes to us in verse 1. It says that Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. The time had come. Jesus knew that the time had come. All across uh, the Gospels, we see that, that Jesus knows of this hour, this hour that is not yet, this hour that he is waiting on. He tells his mom, my hour has not yet come. And here we have clear knowledge that in the upper room with his disciples, as he is preparing to wash their feet, he knows full knowledge that the hour had come. How important is this? Some might attempt to say Jesus didn't know who he was. Jesus didn't know that he was the son of God. Jesus didn't know that he was the Messiah. Jesus didn't know that he was going to suffer and die on our behalf. And yet here in the Gospel of John, chapter 13, verse 1, we see very clearly that Jesus knew. Jesus knew that the hour had come. Jesus knew that he would die. Jesus knew that he would ascend to the Father and he would continue on eternally with God and that makes a way for us. Jesus knew. And from that place, knowing that the cross lie just moments before in front of Jesus What's his priority? When the hour has come, what does Jesus have to do? Set up number one, Jesus knew that the hour had come. And then number two, uh, the very end, the second half of verse one, it says, having loved his own, his disciples, those that followed him, who were in the world, he loved them to the end. Jesus loved everybody that was there with him. And so this interaction and this action should all be placed in the context of Jesus' unconditional, world-changing love for his disciples. Jesus knew that the hour had come. Jesus knew that he loved his disciples And then uh, the the third of these is in verse 2. It says, The evening meal was in progress, and the devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. We know that Jesus knew the hour had come. Jesus loved. Jesus loved everybody there. And everybody there included Peter, James, and John. And everybody there also included Judas. Didn't include Judas like the Judas that was once called and that followed, that that carried the purse, that was faithfully alongside of Jesus all the way. No, 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 no. The, The same Judas, but now changed different because Satan had come into his heart and tempted him to betray Jesus, and Jesus knew that. The third piece of the setup we have to be confronted with, John invites us to be confronted with, is that Jesus knew that Judas had already decided in his heart to follow the temptation of Satan and betray 
Jesus. So we are to read the action, the interaction, and the teaching all in that light. And then last but not least, in verse 3, the last piece of the setup I want to be sure to highlight is in verse 3 it says that Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power. Not, not, not just some things, uh, not the things that were right there in front of him, not things in his purview or his context, not things that chose him, but everything, all things absolutely universally known. Everything is under Jesus' power. That Jesus is over all things. And that he has power, authority, that he is guiding and directing, that, that he has the authority over everyone and everything. So Jesus, who knows his hour had come, who loves those who are gathered and knows even one who is with him is going to betray him. Fully aware of the power and authority that he had, gets up from his table seat, takes off his outer, outer garment, wraps a towel around his waist and one by one goes to his disciples and lays a basin in front of them. And he pours a pitcher of water and one by one he goes to those who serve him who honor him, who call him teacher and Lord, and he washes their feet. Their feet that travel in sandals along dirty roads that are the most uh, dirty, disgusting part of every one of their bodies he goes before them and takes their feet in his hands and he washes them. And then he takes the towel that's around his waist and he dries them. Now this is unbelievable. The one who has all power and authority, the one who for whom everything is designed to serve. He kneels before his disciples and chooses to wash their feet. Now, it's hard for us contextually to fully connect with the fact that he washed their feet. So I want you to, to think back maybe to generations before. My dad says that as he grew up in Port Acres, Texas, until he was 14 years old, when he was in the neighborhood, he did not wear a shirt and he did not wear shoes. That's the kind of thing I need you to connect with, all right? People who live with exposed feet, who don't just walk on carpet or on concrete, who, who don't just walk on streets or roads, and don't just walk on grass, but they walk in the dirt and the muck of the cities and the streets that are not paved. And from that place, as they had traveled in to town from Bethany to Jerusalem, as they had gone through this procession with the palm branches, they have walked in the dust of the earth, and there that night, Jesus chooses to wash their feet. I mean, I, I don't want you to think about your newly manicured, fu fully uh, clean feet. I need you to think about Shaquille O'Neal's feet. And if you haven't seen a picture, don't. Don't do it. I know you're going to be tempted because I said it to Google that. Don't, don't do it. It's, it's going to scare you. I, it, like, 
he washes their feet. And you and I will never be able to fully embrace or appreciate how wonderful and absurd that is. Jesus is at the very least culturally accepted as a rabbinic teacher and by many, including those who who he was gathered with, he is understood to be the son of God, the Messiah. And he washes their feet. So we have a setup and we have an action. And then there's this interaction that, 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 that we're brought into. It's an interaction with, between Peter and Jesus. Uh, we don't know where in this journey uh, with the 12 this fits. In my spiritual imagination, I, I think that this might have been the last of the disciples that he washed their feet. That he, that he started and he went all the way around the table and the very last one was Peter. That's just me. And, and when he gets to Peter, it says, though Peter had watched what, took, what had taken place with each of the other disciples, and he had been building this up within him. Uh, it, it had been a discontent, a dissonance that he could not uh, leave unspoken, and he just laid it out there before Jesus and all of the disciples. He says, you're going to wash my feet? Hmm. And Jesus has this interesting line. We'll come back to this in a second. In verse 7, he says, uh, You don't realize now what I'm doing, but later you will understand. Later you will understand. And then it moves on in the encounter, and, Jesus, and Peter says to Jesus, No, you will not wash my feet. This is not right. This does not make sense. I cannot resolve myself to allow this to take place. My rabbi, my teacher, my Lord is not going to wash my feet. You're not taking that position. If anything, I'm washing your feet. That makes so much more sense. And Jesus has this all-important response for Peter that connects with each of us that can't fathom what it would be for Jesus, our Lord and Savior, Jesus, the one who took on death for our behalf, Jesus, the one who was raised from the dead, who now seat, is seated at the right hand of the Father, who is now in the seat of judgment over all of creation, that very Jesus, we can't imagine that he would wash our feet. And Jesus responds to us saying, unless I wash you, you have no part with me. Unless I wash you, unless you are made clean by me, you aren't reconciled to the Father, Son, and Spirit. You, you don't have a relationship with God unless you are made clean by God. Because if you are trying to figure out how you're going to be clean on your own, how you're going to enter into right relationship with God on your own, you are walking down a, a path of failure. And so rather than walk down that path, understand that Jesus has to make us clean. It's, it's the only way that we are restored and made new. And Jesus says, if you, if you refuse this, if you refuse what I am bringing to you, what I'm offering you, my cleansing work in you, if you refuse it, you don't have a part of me. But it's here for you. I'm literally kneeling before you, offering you this invitation. Receive it. Receive me. Be made clean through me. And that interaction with Peter is an interaction that you and I need to hear over and over again because we never 
feel worthy of what Jesus is offering to us. And yet God made flesh, dwelt among us, and ministered to us by cleansing us entirely from our sins. In the Gospel of John, chapter 13, there's a setup, there's an action, there's an interaction, and then there is a teaching. It's so interesting that, that he just met with Peter and said, Peter, you don't understand now, but, but you will understand, right? He said uh, in verse 7, but later you will understand. And then you get to verse 12, and, uh, and, and, and it's fascinating. He says, do you understand what I have done for you? It, it, it's like... It's like if you're in a classroom as a teacher and you see just glazed eyes and no one is getting what you're teaching. And, uh, and then you say, so I see none of you get it. And then you teach just a little bit more and then you're like, hey, you get it now? <laughs> well, good thing Jesus doesn't leave us just with that question. Like, uh, do you get it now? Jesus digs in and actually reveals to us what this means. He says, you call me teacher and Lord. Teacher and Lord, rightly so, because that is what I am. I am your teacher and your Lord. And now that I, your teacher and Lord, have washed your feet, you should wash one another's feet. Jesus is teacher and Lord. And the beauty of Jesus as teacher is Jesus is teacher who audibly, verbally teaches us. He teaches in the Sermon on the Mount. He teaches when he gathers the, uh, the, the, the disciples and the masses together on the seashore before he feeds the 5,000 and the 4,000. Jesus teaches uh, as he's walking from the Last Supper to the Mount of Olives, which he's about to do in chapters 14, 15, and 16. Jesus teaches, and Jesus teaches by example, by his life's witness. He is a teacher who not only teaches it in word, but he also teaches it in deed. And he is modeling for us, his disciples, what it means to follow him. Because if you're going to follow uh, Jesus, if you're going to say that he's my teacher, he's my rabbi, and, and you're going to devote yourself as a disciple, you're supposed to walk real closely behind him. You're supposed to be almost like step by step in his footsteps. It says that the dust of the rabbi is supposed to come up on you. You're supposed to walk as though you're in the shadow, in the very shadow of the teacher. So that you are not just hearing what he's doing, but you, and you're not even only seeing what he's doing. But you are doing what he's doing. You are walking it out faithfully following Jesus. Jesus says, you call me teacher and Lord, rightly so, because that is what I am. And I wash feet. I wash my disciple. I, 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 I bend the knee, knee. I serve. I offer my whole self. I clean. What are you doing? You should wash one another's feet, Jesus says. But he doesn't leave it there. He says, you call me teacher and you call me Lord. There's another word uh, in verse uh, 16 that's connected there. It says, very truly, I tell you, no servant is greater than his master. This word master and this word Lord are the same root in the Greek, and it's over 700 usages in the New Testament. What an extraordinary thing to know that Jesus is Lord, Jesus is Master. And there are some that might want to uh, dismiss lordship language, that might want to dismiss master language or kingdom language because it might uh, show hierarchy or patriarchy. But if we were to do that, if we were to dismiss the power available to us in lordship language and master language, we would, uh, we would totally uh, miss the gift that it is to see that Jesus is about flipping the script on what we expect 
If we were to lay out what does is, what is a Lord do and what does a master do, we would say that they direct, that they order, that they give commands. And we wouldn't say that they are walking alongside. We wouldn't say that they are, they are in the grit and the grind of the day-to-day with. No, no, no. They would be above and outside of and beyond. But here we have a different sort of Lord and Master. When we follow Jesus... We see that the way of God is different, stands in stark contrast to any human power that we have ever known. In Jesus, we have the one who does the most radical act of service and love that we can fathom. And actually, it's even beyond our modern day fathoming. Brothers and sisters, we have a teacher, a Lord, who serves, who cares for, who cleanses, who ministers to, and then sees you, his follower, and says, you do the same. You offer yourself. You lean in. And you care for my people. Just as I have shown you in this act of love. Jesus is master. Jesus is master. But it's a whole different frame of reference. May we be confronted by that each and every day as we seek to serve him in the world around us. Would you pray with me? Gracious God, confront us, convict us of that which is beyond our our understanding, that which is beyond our grasp. Lord, we can't even begin to imagine what it was like to have you, the Son of God, kneeling before us. So Lord, help us to follow you, to humble ourselves and to offer your service and your love to the world. You are the master. You are the savior. So we go where you lead. As we continue in worship and we enter into this time of offering, we pray, O oh God, that you would bless this, uh, this uh, humble offering, that which we return to you. Lord, we pray that you would use it for your glory, honor, and praise. We pray it in Jesus' name.